tourists about the developer with no name. Riding around in the DevOps desert on the worst thing in uh, I thought I'd start with introducing the developer that's on stage. My name is Tom Tunia, and I work for a Swedish consultant called Jabo. We help our clients in becoming more efficient in their software development process. We help them in their continuous delivery, work with lean, agile, DevOps ways of working. Uh, I work as a developer myself, and as a coach, I coach development teams on uh, you know, how to create quality software at a high pace. I've also happened to work a lot with Jenkins throughout my career, for the previous four or five years or so. So this uh, presentation is a lot about my experiences and uh, some of the work we've been doing at my current client, where I'm consulting. Um, so here are the, some of the topics that we'll discuss today. We're going to discuss some of the common challenges <coughs> we like to face when doing continuous delivery using Jenkins. We can take a quick look at some comparison to other tools we look at some options on how to do continuous delivery changes, and also we're going to look at how we solve some of these challenges that I'm going to talk about. So this is our situation of one of our clients. Uh, uh, this is uh, actually footage of one of my colleagues doing a production upgrade of Jenkins. <laughs> And you can see there on the top right, and you can see back and in there. It doesn't give him lift an eyebrow. He's not surprised at all. He's seen this before. So, really, not an ideal situation to be in. Uh, we have a really ancient uh, version of Jenkins, like 1634, so really lying behind. Uh, it was unmaintainable. We haven't really set it up in the best possible way. I mean, there were no infrastructure as code. Like, this was ages ago when this was set up. Uh, we didn't have proper test environments. Um, we couldn't really try out new changes to Jenkins uh, before he production, which is not really uh, a great way, a great experience for the different development teams. So uh, sometimes we might just up uh, unavailable for the development teams for, for many hours, and that's just not acceptable. So this is not ideal. Another common challenge working with Jenkins is uh, its extensible plugin architecture, which is both a blessing but also one of the big pain points. So I usually call this plugin hell, where all plugins eventually go to die. So it's essentially like dependency management. You have different plugins, uh, they can depend on each other in turn. So if you have one particular plugin that is dependent upon by other plugins, if you update that particular plugin on top there, anything can essentially happen. It's hard to predict these ripple effects. And um, dependency management is hard. And uh, uh, this is a common uh, pain point with Jenkins. Also, another thing with plugins is that how do you validate the actual quality of the plugins? So for instance, I found a plugin that uh, was fit for my particular use case. So I thought, OK, I'm going to uh, install it, try it out, and um, after a while I ran into some null pointer exception or some, some, some other type of error. And as a developer I thought that, that should be quite easy for me to, uh, uh, to do a reproducing test case for and fix it. So I thought I'll just clone the code, download it, um, create a test case for it and I can provide a fix upstream. Uh, but there were no tests whatsoever in the source code. It wasn't, it wasn't even literally like source test, it was just source main. So I was like really scared and turned me off from using that plugin. Like, how can they ever know that there's no regressions when they create uh, new code changes or provision new updates to that particular uh, plugin? And many plugins are just developed one, is one off by somebody who's not a developer. So how do you validate the quality of plugins? That's something to keep in mind when uh, you're deciding which plugins to use. So there's a, a homepage called stats.jenkins.io. So if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's a resource where they collect all kinds of statistics around Jenkins about all the known uh, worldwide installations, which versions they're running. Uh, you can see the different plugins, uh, which versions are the most used ones. So as a plugin developer, this can be very useful. Uh, th they also have this feature to, to specify a certain plugin, and you can get a dependency graph of it and see which other plugins depend on it. So for instance, if you, you, you type in git here for, to see the git plugin, you can 
actually see how many other plugins depend on it. So in this case, it's 48 different plugins that depend on the Git plugin. So if you have the Git plugin and a lot of these different dependencies, essentially anything uh, could go wrong if you just upgrade the Git plugin. So it's, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, there's also this visualization. Uh, so you can easily see uh, the Death Star architecture here going on. Another interesting thing in Jenkins, like, it tells you when there's new, new versions to use, which is really convenient. Like, oh, this new version of Jenkins, like 2.103. Uh, and I mean, we're running a really ancient version, 1.634. So, hey, there's an upgrade automatic button. Do I dare to press it? I mean, what could go wrong? I, I obviously, they thought about this, so it could upgrade automatically. Um, but we haven't dared to press it yet. Um, but we thought, we need to address this situation. We can't have um, a continuous delivery set up, because we were doing continuous delivery on this old platform, and uh, it works surprisingly well. Uh, but we can't really give the development teams all the different features that they want. So we were more a bottleneck in our team, which is the like the, the delivery team, we provide uh, these services like Jenkins and the continuous deployment platform um, for the development teams to just be as efficient as possible. We couldn't like really get out of the way because depending on, on us. I mean, we've set this Jenkins up in such a way that all the build agents, for instance, uh, were also set up more or less manually. So if there's a new Java version, like when Java 9 came, we need to create a new agent, make sure Java 9 is installed there. Um, same thing with Java 10, we have to make a new agents for that. So the, the development teams were dependent on us, and which is, uh, wasn't ideal. We rather uh, want them to be able to choose their own tools. Uh, and we can more be the enablers for the development team to be as efficient as possible instead of a bottleneck. So we thought, okay, how, how, can, we, how can we achieve this in the best possible way? Uh, is, and the, pressing that button is not one of the options. So we decided, look, let's start from scratch and evaluate everything from the beginning. Maybe there's some better tools out there today that's not Jenkins. Uh, so we just thought of really going through what requirements we actually have on a CI CD platform uh, these days. And these are context uh, specific. So for, for, for our use case, uh, here are some of the uh, things we had on our requirement list, and they might look different for you. Like, for instance, for us, it was important to be able to run on-premise. Uh, we want to have uh, isolated builds using containers, good pipeline visualization. That was the most important ones. Uh, but we made a checklist, and then we could start reading up on different uh, CI, CD tools and evaluate them uh, fairly to make a fair assessment of what tool are we going to use going forward. So our goals was to satisfy the customers, which for, for us was the development teams. Those were our customers. Be able to give them uh, what they want to be efficient. And we also want to have a good way of working with Jenkins. So we don't want to end up in the same mess with, that we had before. So it's no point in us doing uh, all this rework, setting up a new platform, and then in three years time, it, it looks the same as the previous one. So we want a good way of working with Jenkins and uh, be able to be certain that when we push changes to Jenkins, that we actually, that actually work. So some of the uh, tools that we compared uh, was, um, except for Jenkins, was GoCD, TeamCity, Concourse, Bamboo, uh, and Drone. And we just read up on them, evaluate, evaluated them, uh, checked them off, compared to our checklist, which qualifies, which does not. Uh, in our case, uh, the, um, the finalists were Jenkins and GoCDs. So we played around with them uh, uh, for a few weeks, just doing a proper proof of concept, trying out things that were important for us, like infrastructure as code, what's the support, uh, what's the support for a building with uh, Docker containers, for instance, um, visualization, all these different aspects. And in the end, we decided to go with um, uh, Jenkins again. I guess uh, the, the presentation title was uh, a little bit of a spoiler here. So why did we decide to go with Jenkins? Mostly because it's open source. There's a good community around it. Some of the tools we looked at, for instance, like Bamboo, essentially the community is more or less dead. So it's, if you run into issues, it's hard to find uh, uh, solutions or, um, or get some help. And this is really important, I think. 
So, so bamboo disqualified for that reason, for instance. Uh, we like Jenkins because even though uh, the plugins um, can become quite a hell, we still think that a lot of different integrations already exist. We don't need to re-implement a lot of uh, things that are maybe specific for, uh, for our company that we would need to do with some of the other CI-CD tools we looked at. And I think one of the, the biggest benefits was that we already knew it. Like, I've been working with Jenkins for a lot of years, my colleagues as well, and to be honest, in this organization we had 15 development teams, and they all are familiar with working with Jenkins in one way or another, so they're familiar with the UI and so on. So we decided to proceed with Jenkins. So, how do you create your uh, continuous delivery pipelines in Jenkins? Well, there's two different options. Uh, the, the first option is what you've been able to do for, for many, many, many years, which is to use traditional build jobs and then chain them together as downstream dependencies. So Jenkins essentially is a CI tool which allows you to, in one particular uh, job, run, for instance, a build with some unit tests and so on, and it reports back the results. So you can use this to put all your pipeline in one particular build, for instance, but that provides quite um, uh, less than ideal uh, visualization and feedback into what's happening if you're running all these different things that you need to do in your pipeline in one particular build. So traditionally, you split this up into different jobs and let's chain them together with downstream dependencies. And this works really well. Um, you're able to rerun parts of the pipeline, for instance, if you run through the build, all the testing that you have where, when you hit deploy and there's some temporary issue, like for instance a network failure, you can easily rerun that step and not need, have the need to run everything from scratch. Um, you can create more sophisticated pipelines with fan out, fan in scenarios, run stuff in parallel, uh, very easy. Uh, you can set this up with code, like infrastructure's code, configuration as code, uh, with Jenkins Job Builder or Job DSL, for instance. Uh, although my experience is that eventually it will be quite hard to maintain. If you use a Jenkins Job Builder, for instance, you can use um, YAML and you can have templates and all of a sudden you have templates, which use templates, which use templates, and all of a sudden you're completely lost on what you need to do. And it can be quite, even though it's flexible, it can be quite messy to like, bring in a new piece to the puzzle in, in, in the middle here. Uh, and Job DSL is, is a great project, but uh, I've seen Job DSL projects that are um, essentially bigger than the actual software that they're going to deploy. So it can be easily become like a huge um, uh, software product on its own. So the recommend, recommended way of doing things nowadays is to use uh, Jenkins pipelines, uh, which is essentially is a, um, a plugin suite. Uh, I don't really remember exactly how many plugins that involves, but it has a pipeline plugin, which is an umbrella term for a lot of different plugins that allows you to uh, describe your whole delivery flow essentially in, in one configuration file. So you can, you can either have, have this as configuration inside Jenkins or you can put this in version control alongside your source code. So for instance, uh, the default naming convention is to call this file Jenkins file and it has all the description of your whole pipeline. So you can version control it alongside with your code, it can evolve alongside with the code, so if you have to go back in time to see how a particular version of your software looked like, you can see this, uh, how the pipeline looked like uh, at that point in time. Um, pros and cons, um, it essentially allows you to write all of your pipeline as um, a groovy code. So you have a full-blown programming language at your disposal, which is really powerful, but it can uh, obviously also give you a little bit too much power. So there's a few different options here. You can either use a scripted pipeline which allows you to do essentially anything you want in code and you have the declarative pipeline which kind of enforces you to use uh, some particular um, best practices for how to describe your pipelines. One of the biggest drawbacks to Jenkins pipelines is that even today there's no really built-in way to rerun parts of your pipeline, like later stages. So if you have a long running pipeline that takes an hour to run, and then it fails on the uh, deploy stage later on, uh, maybe for a network issue or something temporary, you just want to rerun that. You can't really do that. You have to run everything from scratch. But for a long running pipeline, 
uh, it's really frustrating. And I know some companies have actually migrated away from Genghis pipelines just for this reason, to use uh, traditional build jobs instead. So I know that they, this has been a hot debate on the Jenkins issue tracker, whether um, they're going to implement this, if it's going to be open source, or if it's going to be in the commercial uh, enterprise edition or not. Uh, so now they decide to actually uh, put this feature into the declarative pipelines as open source, but uh, uh, I know it's in progress because I follow the ticket. It's quite interesting to get a mail every time somebody uh, comes on that issue. So I've not yet seen how it will work uh, because it's in progress, but maybe it will be something that's uh, useful. I mean, it should be one of the uh, basic functions, I think, when you're doing continuous delivery to be able to rerun parts of the pipeline. So let's talk a little bit about visualization. Uh, if you heard my previous talk today, I'll talk a lot about visualization and the importance of, uh, importance of visualization. It can allow you to get fast feedback and feedback in a, in a much easier way than instead of having to drill down into to Jenkins UIs, read console logs to find out how your build is doing. If you can visualize this, and for instance, a big screen TV in your team area, you can get visual feedback immediately, whether your code change is working or not, where it is in the pipeline, and so on. It becomes like subconscious. You, you, can, you don't even need to go into Jenkins to see where your code change is. If it will fail, you will notice on the screen just next to you. So I think visualization is really important for, for um, uh, fostering uh, fast feedback loops. So this is the main or default uh, Jenkins pipeline view that you have uh, if you start to use Jenkins pipelines. So this is called the stage view plugin. It has different stages that you can see on the top, like build test stage, deployment staging, and so on. Um, and essentially just an array or matrix of your different pipelines. So this is decent, but uh, uh, if, if you don't uh, uh, have any experience with other visualization, you might think this is sufficient, but I think uh, there's usually a lot more that's happening within one particular stage that you would like to know. For instance, the test stage, if you have several test suites running there, it would be nice to see which one of them fail, not just like all the tests fail. So, or you have multiple operations within your deployment stage, you might want to be able to visualize that. For instance, if you're running in the deploy stage database migrations, uh, if you're running uh, the actual deployment, what is it doing, uh, what did it fail on, and so on. So one option is to just have smaller stages, more fine-grained, but it ends up being you have, you have these really long pipelines instead, which is not really ideal either and doesn't look too good on big information radiators either. So the heavy marketed Blue Ocean plugin um, is what, if you read the documentation, is what they uh, try to sell you on and using instead. This is the overview if you go into a particular pipeline, this is what you see. So I had high hopes for the Blue Ocean plugin when it was announced, but I, I really think after using it for a while, it's a little bit of a swing and a miss because they're missing this use case of actually making proper visualization available on uh, big information radiators. So I have to actually go in here and click into the different uh, uh, runs of the pipeline in order to get some uh, information about what happened. Like if you have a failed, a failed pipeline, you have to go in there, then you can see where it failed on. Uh, you can also, this is what it looks like uh, if you have a green build. So uh, there's still room for improvement here, I think. There's a third option that's called the Delivery Pipeline plugin, which, a small disclaimer here, I uh, might be a bit biased since I'm one of the maintainers of this plugin, but this allows you to have more fine-grained visualization of what's happening within one particular stage. So if you see in the different, in the test stage, for instance, that's one stage in your Jenkins pipeline, but using a task pipeline method, you can add more fine-grained visualization to what's actually happening. It also has a full screen view, uh, so it can easily be visualized on big screen TVs out through the office hallway. So many of my customers that I've been working with as consultant use this, um, uh, this plugin to visualize uh, all the different pipelines for all the different teams throughout their office. So we started talking about Jenkins files a while ago. So 
if you put all your different your pipeline configurations in one big file, check into version control, that's fine. It can be quite quite big, a lot of lines of code there. Um, and if you have to repeat that for every project, then you will end up with like maybe I don't know, 100 repositories, which has essentially somewhat the same file. And if you need to do uh, adjustment or small change that uh, affects all of your pipelines, then uh, it will be a mess. It will be really bothersome to do. So one way of handling this is to um, make use of a plugin that's called Pipeline Shared Groovy Libraries, which allows you to extract common functionality from your pipelines, put in one particular place. So if you have, for instance, 100 pipelines, and they all need to upload Java artifacts to Nexus, for instance, you can route all, all that functionality through your shared pipeline library. So if you need to do adjustments there, uh, you can change to one place, it will affect all the different pipelines. If you have to change a URL, for instance, you can do it to one place. Which means you can have your link is files a lot smaller and much easier to maintain. This is something that we used um, uh, quite a lot with my current client. I also created a, a template project for, for working with this shared group library. It's called Jenkins Pipeline Shared Library Template. You can find it on the uh, Diabo, my employer's uh, GitHub page. And it's set up so that you have your code in a source. Uh, in a source directory, where you put all this common functionality, but you also have a test directory, and this whole project is set up as a Gradle project, so you can actually use Gradle to build and test your uh, Jenkins shared library pipeline function functionality. So you get some sense of fast feedback um, and a little bit of a safety net to know that if you make changes to this uh, shared library, that it will actually work or not before provisioning it. So in our case, uh, if you're doing something, for instance, that interacts with Git, you can put that in a specific class, like git.groovy. You can create some unit tests for that. And just run this with Gradle to make sure that everything works as, as expected. Then you have the varse directory, which essentially is your entry point to your custom pipeline methods. So in our case, we have a lot more classes than this, but essentially we built all this common functionality in one project that we can handle uh, in, in a central place and version control it and so on. So the benefits of having the common functionality here is that if we want the development teams to migrate from the old platform to the new one, we don't want them to be able to rewrite all of their software uh, or start to create all these huge Jenkins files to be able to adopt the new system. Uh, to be honest, the maturity between different development teams varies regarding on continuous delivery, best practice, and so on. It's not easy to start writing Jenkins file if you've never done it before. So we don't want to just dump that on development teams. I mean, my, my team, that's what we're good at. So that's what we want to provide that as a service for the teams. So we want to have a Jenkins file that's easy to adopt. It, will be, it should be easy to adopt this new platform. I want to provide some convention over configuration. So for instance, 99% of all the backend services are written in Java, running with Maven. So if you specify this is a Java project, that's enough for us to uh, infer that you will probably build this with Maven and this particular JDK, because that's what's most used. But you can customize this further and, uh, and specify exactly uh, how you want to build this. And we use Docker to, to build all of, our, uh, all of our products in this new Jenkins setup. Uh, so we can actually allow the development teams to select their own tools they want to use. If they don't want to use this convention we have, they're free to just set up a Docker uh, image, which has all the different build tools that's required for them to, to build their application. And they can just use that. They don't need to go for, to, through us anymore if they want to try out the new uh, JDK or another tool, Kotlin, whatever. As long as it builds in a container, they're, they're able to choose their own tools. So we don't need to be a bottleneck anymore. So this is an example Jenkins file uh, to build a, just a basic Java library at this, uh, this particular client. So there's not many lines of code because we use con convention of configuration. And we have extracted from our Jenkins file all this common functionality to this uh, shared library. So when you're working with these shared libraries, um, it has an interesting 
called branching strategy. You could either deploy uh, this shared library as a plugin, but then it will be um, a little bit more uh, cumbersome to maintain. You have to treat it as a plugin and so on. Um, what, what the recommend in you doing is just to point to uh, source control where you store this library and will automatically check out the source code for this common functionality when you run different builds. And you can do that, uh, load them implicitly. However, this one particular issue, so if, this, if you're running a particular build, um, you can see that there's two different Git revisions down here. One is for the actual software that we're building for a particular service, and the other revision is for the Jenkins pipeline library. So for developers, it's not really intuitive which one is, is which. So, and it's not really ideal to just point a master. So even though we build our, um, our pipeline library with Gradle, so we check in something to master and it will fail. It doesn't even compile. If you just point to master, it will fail all the different pipelines for our development team. So we don't want that. So we have just a simple uh, CI type of pipeline for our shared library as well, where we make sure to just compile run the unit tests, and that's like a base foundation, uh, a b basic safety net for us when we're working with this pipeline library. And then we do a git tag. We, we call it Jenkins pipeline DSL latest. We can use that instead when we uh, load this library when, when we kick off pipelines. So then we can see the Jenkins pipeline DSL latest tag here uh, under the revisions. I have not yet found out the way to just uh, hide this completely. So if somebody knows, then uh, I'm happy to hear more about it. So how do we avoid ending up in this mess again? We don't want this. This is what we want to avoid. So one of the first things you can think of is infrastructure as code. Setting up everything with Ansible, for instance, is that, is that enough? I would say no. You still need a test environment. Or how do you test things locally? Um, it's hard to find out issues before you actually deploy it to, to one of the <coughs> live systems. We want to have much shorter feedback loops. Because when we're developing on Jenkins, common, common pipeline functionality, or uh, we want to bring in a new plugin, upgrade a plugin, we want to know that as soon as possible. So why don't we treat our pipelines just the way and third-party software as Jenkins, the same way we treat all of our other software to develop in-house. Like, I mean, if you're doing continuous delivery, your pipeline is the only path to production, and it's a strategic asset for your company, so why don't we treat it as such? It should be first-class software. So we want to be able to run our Jenkins instance uh, locally. We want to have a pipeline for it. So if we do changes, we're able to, to run a, a test suite locally, get feedback whether that coaching works or not. If it does, we can push that, have a pipeline for it. And then we can have good confidence when we actually deploy this code change to our users, which are the development teams. That's what we want to achieve here. So here's the mandatory 2018 uh, DevOps continuous delivery container slide. But we, we used the Docker to, to, to realize this. I mean, Docker is great for you to be able to run um, systems or services, applications, um, regardless of which operating system you use. So if I develop on a Mac, for instance, I can easily bring up a Jenkins instance, uh, and it will be essentially the same as a colleague of mine that runs Arch Linux or something. It will be the same as we run uh, in our CI and production environments. And Jenkins provides some base Docker images, which are really useful for you to just extend and create, where you can put your, in, your own configuration, certificates, and so on. So this, this is a really good base foundation that we want to use. So we thought, let's just set up everything with Docker in this new setup, all the Jenkins uh, master and all the agents are Dockerized, so we can run the whole setup local if we want to. So we did this by using Gradle which is a build tool uh, for Java, we, where we essentially just uh, build our Docker images for the master and agents. We have a test suite where we create, use the Jenkins API to create some basic pipelines for some um, basic mock 
Java Maven services, Java Gradle services, some other services that we then run in the test suite, which uses our pipeline shared uh, library, the common functionality, to validate that things like tagging in Git works, upload to Nexus, uh, th those tests are run against a mock. So we get some kind of confidence in that if we do this code change, we won't break for all the development teams. So have this test suite in, in Gradle as well. So the essential structure is just we have a folder for Jenkins agents, we have our certificates there, a Docker file for, we, we, there's not much configuration um, uh, from the vanilla uh, agent image that is provided by Jenkins. Then we have the master, we have some more configurations there, we have all of configuration to configure our Jenkins master, we put that in, as Groovy files in the init.groovyd directory, which uh, is a directory that Jenkins will go through and it will run all the different Groovy scripts that are there <coughs> at startup, so it's a great way to <coughs> configure Jenkins. We have a plugins.txt file where you can specify which plugins you want to use and of which version. So we can have this in version control as well, which plugins we want to use. So if you do a, a change of an, a plugin, for instance, we only need to actually do an update in that particular text file. So if we run this Gradle build, it will uh, build these containers. It will then run the tests, spin up these newly built Docker images, run test suite against those, that version. Um, we don't do this local, but if you run to CI, it also uploads the new uh, Docker images that we just built to our internal Docker registry. And then we have the option to, to deploy the changes as well. So I thought of um, spending a little bit of time on the tests, which I think is interesting. Like, how do we do the tests? So we use um, a testing and specification framework for Java that's called Spark, which allows you to write testing with a uh, given when then syntax. And since essentially Gradle is written with Groovy, most of the Jenkins configuration is written in Groovy. Spark allows to write Groovy. It blends in very well uh, with the ecosystem that we have. And then we use a framework called Test Containers, which is um, also a Java library to, to run Docker containers with your tests. So this is really useful. So Test Containers, before we execute our test, we specify which Docker images we want to run on which version, and we'll start these containers before starting executing tests, and the tests are finished, it will automatically tear down the containers. So I'm going to sh show a small example of uh, one of our tests that actually verifies that the plugins that we have specified in our plugins.txt are actually the ones that are installed and they're all available. Because sometimes it happens that you try to just upgrade one plugin to a, to a new minor version, and then you log into Jenkins to see Oh, but these other plugins that depend on that one just fail to load and you get this huge page of red error messages that um, plugins fail to load. And that's one of the things that we want to discover early in the process. So essentially we want to have a test for that, verifying that the plugins that we want to use actually are there and working as expected. So using test containers, they have this, uh, this nice SDK. So they have a notion of a class called generic container, which essentially says, this is just specify the image name and version we want to use, and we'll boot this up before the tests are run. So we create our own abstraction on top of that, called Jenkins Master Container, essentially just giving the, the name of our uh, Docker image, uh, the version, and just some minor configuration, like to set up a few agents as well. And then we also make sure to use a setup spec method, which is essentially um, a function that's run before your tests are executed. So we use the, uh, the Java API, or Jenkins Java API, or SDK, there's a Java library for that, to talk to the Jenkins master that we just booted up with Docker, get all the plugins that are installed through the plugin manager, and then we can have test cases, for, for instance, verifying that a particular plugin is installed, which is Spock syntax, like given a configured plugin, we expect this plugin to be present and then aware syntax when we just go through a loop all, through all the different uh, configured plugins. So then when we run, the, for instance, this plugin test in our ID through IntelliJ that we use, we can uh, get fast feedback on that everything is as we expected. Sometimes it has happened that we upgrade a plugin, it doesn't work, 
the test will fail. So we spent, uh, to be honest, uh, a little bit more time than I would have liked on getting the whole test suite up and running, but uh, we so quickly uh, get return on that investment to pick up these uh, silly mistakes that you're likely to do uh, or <coughs> that will go unnoticed until you actually hit a real uh, environment. So we want to work, yes, it's continuous delivery, but continuous delivery is a continuous delivery system. Work in small increments, constantly push changes to uh, the continuous delivery platform. So is it possible to automate Jenkins? Yes, it is. Sometimes it's uh, a lot more effort than you would expect it to or uh, that you would want to. Sometimes uh, you know how to exactly click through the UI or which checkbox to mark in the UI to get certain configuration in place. Um, and sometimes you end up uh, scouting various different GitHub repositories, open source code to find out how are these plugins supposed to be configured uh, using Groovy code. So we'll do a lot of that with the init Groovy D uh, way of doing things. So for instance, if you want to configure how your integration towards Bitbucket is set up, we can do this. Uh, through this init Groovy D script. So we have a Groovy script that does this configuration for us. Uh, the main drawback here is that you're actually using internal classes here. You're using classes that's available on the Java class path. So it's, this is a little bit brittle. The, many of these different classes that you're using here, they're not supposed to be exposed. But Jenkins runs Java 8, so you're allowed to uh, use all the different classes and methods you want to use like with Java 9 and modularity, you wouldn't be able to do uh, all of those things, for instance. But Jenkins doesn't support Java 9 uh, as of yet, uh, to my knowledge at least. So the problem here is that if you, for instance, up, uh, upgrade the Bitbucket plugin, there's no guarantee that this constructor hasn't changed. It has four parameters now, but maybe in the next version, this developers just refactor the constructor because it's not being thought of, being used externally. And then this will fail, it won't even compile, and we'll notice at the start, uh, start time. So this is something to keep in mind as well. That's where it helps to have this test suite as well, if you can notice these things. So essentially we now have a Jenkins pipeline for, for a Jenkins instance. So when we develop something, we can run uh, the builds and tests locally. We have enough confidence, we can just push that, and it will essentially do the same thing as CI. So our Jenkins, our Dockerized Jenkins, will actually build the new images of Jenkins, spin this up, run some tests against it, and then we have the ability to deploy the changes if we want to. So to summarize this presentation, um, some of the challenges we had was to have an unmaintainable Jenkins, wasn't set up in the best possible way, uh, no infrastructure as code, no test environments, uh, we just want to treat everything as code. Everything should go into uh, version control. We want to be able to work with Jenkins uh, and all other third-party software that are critical in our path to production for the development teams um, in a good, sustainable way. So we want to have short feedback loops uh, that um, we, we can trust um, the different coachings that we're provisioning to the production environments so that those will actually work. So, Short feedback and continuous delivery of the continuous delivery system. Thank you very much for listening. So I guess we have some time for questions, if you'd like to. Otherwise, I know there's uh, something going on in the expiry, so we can uh, have some questions from there as well, if you don't want to hang out here. Yeah, please. Which Okay, so the, the question is, how long did it take, take you to make the change from 1634 to 2.103? Well, it's still a work in progress. I mean, we, we don't expect people to just, uh, we don't want to onboard all the different projects immediately to a new platform as well. So uh, we're still um, very much like you, in the middle of this transition. So we onboarded just to part of the projects to make sure that we can grind out some issues that we were likely to, to have um, before bringing a lot of load. We want to make sure it's stable enough because otherwise if you provide a, a horrible service for the first one that onboards, they'll probably think like, what have these guys been doing? I'd rather use the old platform instead. We don't want that. 
and we want to give them something else than the old platform uh, can give them as well. Many of the plugins that we would like to use um, they aren't even supported on our old system. So we have to give them uh, we have to give them more user value of using the new system than for the old one. Thank you.